We praise you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus, our Savior, our perfect Redeemer. Jesus, you have done everything that we need for life and godliness. You've done it all. You've accomplished it all on the cross when you rose again from the dead and are seated now at the right hand of God. And we have access to you at all times. And we thank God for it. We thank you, Lord, that it's finished. The work of the cross is finished, which means for the body of Christ that we have health, we have healing, we have sustenance. The things of God never run out. So what do you need? Grab hold of the horns of the altar, so to speak, and don't let go until you receive what it is you need in Jesus name. So what is it you need body of Christ? Go after it and get it. It's yours. It's mine. All things were given to us that pertain to life and godliness. Nothing has been left out. So go get what you need and don't give up until you have it. Take the promises of God and use them as your ax to mow down that tree that's in front of you, that forest that's in front of you. Take the ax of God's word and cut down the obstacles that stand before you. Because God is all powerful and his word is alive. It's sharp. It can penetrate anything. It can move any obstacle. And it is eternal. It never, the word of God never loses its power. It will never weaken. It will never end. The word of God will never perish. It's always available to us all. God will never hide his word from us. He will never quit answering our prayers. He will never quit moving on our behalf. He will never stop listening to us. He will never say enough, no more. He will never utter those words. He will always have his ears open to hear the cries of the righteous. Amen. Because he loves us with such an enduring love, with so much love. If you could, body of Christ, experience the love of God in Christ for you, your heart would burst with the power of that love and you could not maintain life because his love is that strong. I've experienced it myself, and my heart began to ache in pain with the love of God that he poured into my heart. My heart got so painful, painfully full of his love, that I had to say, stop. And the instant I said it, it stopped. But he was just demonstrating to me his love that he has poured out for each one of us through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't give up on your prayers. Don't give up on your petitions. You go after what you want in God. You go get it. It's up to you whether you receive it or not. Take the word and use it as a battering ram against the powers of darkness. They have to stop with the word of God coming out of your mouth. The word is alive and active and it's oh so sharp. And it can cut and it can damage and it can destroy every power of darkness that you and I send it to. The problem is that the word has to be in our mouth and we have to do the sending. God's already sent his word. He's already sent his word to earth in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he's given us his word in this Bible. 
And this word is alive, it's electric, it's active, it's so sharp that there is nothing that can withstand the power of this word to cut and destroy and hack off and pull down and finish the, the obstacle that's before us. There's nothing that can withstand the power of the word. The only thing that can withstand the power of the word is if we do not speak it out of our own mouths, if we do not employ it, if we do not render it forth, if we do not speak it, if we do not proclaim it, if we do not send it on its mission for which we need it to cut and destroy. If we do not send it, it will not go. If we do not send it out of our own heart, our own spirit, our own mouth, if it remains in this book closed, it will not empower you, it will not prosper you, it will not finish the work that it's supposed to finish, and it will not change your circumstances if we don't send it. But here it is. Here it is. It's alive. If we could see the life that's in this supernatural book, if we could see the energy, the energy of God, if we could see the supernatural power that comes from this word when it comes out of our heart and through our mouth, out into the universe, out into the world, out into the, the demonic forces that are arrayed against us. If we could only see it with our eyes, we would be speaking the word and speaking the word. What is your need? Find scripture that cover your need and begin to declare it and a, declare it with alacrity and boldness and don't stop until you have your petition that you need, that you simply must have, that you can't live without. God has put it in our hands to change our circumstances. It's no longer in his hands, body of Christ, and I want you to hear this. Our changing, our circumstances is no longer in God's hands. Well, isn't that a revelation? Our changing, our circumstances is now in our hands through this book, through these words, for these words being employed by us through our very own mouth, through our very own spirit, meditating on the promises that we need to conquer the obstacle that we have before us. And make no mistake, Every believer either has an obstacle before them or will have an obstacle before them. So what are we to do? Just pray to God? Yes, we pray to God. But we employ the word. We send the word forth because it's alive and it's active. And it's a living thing that we send out into the atmosphere to render down the obstacles, the powers and principalities that are arrayed against every Christian on earth. We send forth the word, we speak it, we mutter it, we pray it, we meditate on it, we say it, and we declare it until we have that thing that we need. And I've shared this example before but we had a friend, a minister, and he was asleep in his room. And he had, when he woke up, he had a vision. And he saw out in the hall a table that was bedecked with gold jewels, the most priceless jewels that are on earth and beyond. And the table was actually lit up with brilliant light that emanated from the table. And he saw it in his spirit. And it had such 
reflection of light, it looked like it was piled with diamonds and sapphires and jewels of every kind that was on that table. Priceless. There were priceless gemstones, golden and, and the most marvelous of diamonds, like the Hope Diamond, all over this table. And he said, what could that be? He got up and he went out into the hall and he went down to the table. Guess what was laying on the table? His Bible. His Bible was on the table. And that's what's in this Bible. Sparkling diamonds, gold, the most priceless of jewels, platinum. Everything that you could imagine that the body of Christ that people need is found in this word. But it's like that if we don't get into the word and speak the promises of God, then they just lay in the Bible and they will not affect a thing until this word comes out of our mouth by faith. And I want to tell us all, you don't have to feel one thing. You don't have to feel goosebumps. You don't have to feel a tremendous anointing to speak forth the word of God. As you employ it and speak it out of your mouth, you can feel deader than a doornail. But as long as it comes out of your mouth, it will be energy personified from the living God, and it will go out and change your life and your life circumstances. But if you don't speak it, if you don't meditate on it, if you don't believe it, if you don't have the alacrity to get it into your heart and your spirit and your soul, it can't change a thing. The problems will continue until we, the body of Christ, pick up these, these golden bejeweled promises and speak them forth. And we speak them and speak them and speak them. It doesn't matter how long we speak them until we have victory in that area that we need victory. And victory will come. It cannot not come because this is the living, breathing word of God. It's alive, the Bible itself. God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit wrote the book through men over centuries. And the Holy Spirit, who is God, the energy, the power source of God, the living, living, lightning power of God, gave it to men throughout the ages so that we would have this book as our treasure. Give up every other book you have to give up, never give up your Bible. Because this Bible has the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to conquer every problem known to mankind. But it will never affect anything as long as it stays closed. It's such a treasure. The Bible's such a treasure. No wonder in the dark ages, one of the first things that happened, the word of God no longer was spoken. The word of God was cloistered. The word of God was hidden. And because of that, the world was plummeted into the dark ages. Isn't that amazing that stifling, destroying the word of God could plummet the world into the dark ages? Where creativity stopped. Where men languished for lack of hope. And it wasn't until the Enlightenment, when the Bible became available, Tyndall developed the press to be able to print the Bible for every person. 
that the world started to flourish again. Isn't that amazing? That speaks volumes to us. We have problems that seem inconquerable. Get the word. Get the word that covers those promises and go after it day and night until you have victory. Because you always will have victory. Because this is a living, breathing book out of God's own heart, mind, soul, and spirit given to us. Amen. Hallelujah. God spoke to me, and I want to just talk to you a moment before pastor comes. God spoke to me and said, I want to do a new thing. There's a new thing for every person. Do you, do you, all, do you all sense that? That there's something new that you can have? There's something coming. You don't know exactly what it is. It's kind of in the netherland right now. But there's a new thing. And it's on the horizon of God for every believer who will go after it. So, how do we go after it? How do we go after the new thing that God has already put out for each one of us? In his goodness. God's, a, God's such a good father that he always has something new. Especially when we need it. So how do we go after it? We get scriptures. And scriptures. Google in, in the Bible reference, the new thing. Start praying about the new thing. And the thing about the new thing is it's new. But it's also sometimes very unexpected. And it's fresh. And it's alive. And frequently, it's things that we never thought of. We never thought of asking God for. It never dawned on us because sometimes our mind is so very finite. So what is the new thing for each one that's hearing this? What is the new thing? Well, I'll tell you the first thing is, if you don't pursue it, you won't have it. Now it's on the table the new thing is on the table, out for everyone to partake of. Everyone who's willing, who's eager, who's hungry. And the thing about the new thing is, you have to be hungry. If you're not hungry, you will not go after it. And that has to do with anything in God. If we're not hungry for whatever it is that God has given us, we will never go after it. We will never seek his face for it. We won't even ask him for it unless we're hungry for it or desperate for it, must have it. So I want to read you some scriptures before pastor comes. What is the new thing? What is the new thing for you? What is the unexpected goodness of God new thing? that he has for you. Does anybody want to know? Am I the only one that wants to know? I want to know desperately the new thing. Because I've had some new things happen from God and they were always unexpected. Sometimes just so unexpected that you never thought of it. But it was the new thing and it was perfect for that moment. Now, we can't live without the new thing, body of Christ, and God doesn't want us to. He must have us having the new thing. I'm going to read some scriptures. I'll open a new door, and supernatural increase will come, but you must mix faith and my promises to you. Now, this was a word spoken to Pastor Kimberly. And she recorded it. I'll open a new door, 
and supernatural increase will come. But you must mix faith with my promises to you. Okay, so body of Christ, that clarifies how we obtain the new thing. We get the promises of God. Here are pages and pages of the promises of God. Write out the promises of God and begin to read them, meditate on them, and pray them. We all know, I believe, the efficacy of praying the word itself. Just the pure word of God, praying it back to the Lord. After all, it emanated from him. Why wouldn't we take that word, stuff it in our hearts, in our spirits, in our mouth, in our ears, in our eyes, and pray it back to God? Because it came from him. So we know that it's alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it discerns everything. So let's take the word and go after it. Because God has a new door opening for everyone who will believe him for it. Maybe you don't think you need a new door. Maybe you're satisfied. If you're satisfied, then chances are that new door will not open for you. But for those who are hungry, there is a new door. Jesus said this, My people are experiencing lack, and most of them do not know how to overcome it. They do not at all know me as the God of the breakthrough. This was spoken to pastor. You tell them that the God of the breakthrough wants to visit them, but you must prepare yourself for his presence. Well, how do we do that? We pray. We seek his face. Maybe we fast a meal or two here, here and there. And we get in his face. I love that expression because it presents such a wonderful picture. My face pushed into his face. Eye contact, eyeball to eyeball, nose to nose, chin to chin. After the new thing. That's called boldness. We can get that bold with God. Isn't that wonderful? So he said he'd open a new door. Job 8, 7. Though my beginning is small, my future days will be very great. But my future days will greatly increase, and you will flourish me even in old age. Well, you can be young and believe this promise. The flourishing of God, the new things. Even though our beginnings were small, my beginning was very small. It was just a it was just an opening to what God may be until I pestered him so much that the glory broke open and I saw I saw him for who he was. But my beginnings were very small. It was just with my sister constantly telling me about the experience that she was having when we were in, in college. And she happened to live across, I managed the apartment, she lived across the hall and she kept coming over and talking to me about the new thing that she was experiencing. Well, at that time I was in the radical left movement and I had this urge to throw her out of my apartment and lock the door. I wanted to so bad, but I couldn't move. I had to sit and listen. I wanted to, I wanted to get rid of her. I wanted her mouth to close and I wanted her words to go away. But I couldn't move and I couldn't, I had to sit and listen. And as I sat and listened to the new thing that she told me, about the Lord Jesus Christ, things changed. I had hate in my heart toward God, primarily because of the Vietnam War and how it wrecked my family, primarily because of the war, but I didn't have hate in my heart for Jesus. So she started talking to me about Jesus, and that was the new thing. And the new thing exploded in my life and changed me forevermore. That's what a new thing can do, beloved. Just the new thing.
whatever it is for you. For me, it was eternal life. But then there are other new things from the point of accepting Jesus. There will always be a new thing because Jesus has stored up for his people blessings that never end. They never end. They will never end. His blessings are so innumerable that they will never end. They will never stop. They always flow. There's a constant flow of blessings from God to his people. But too many times we are entrenched in the mire of our daily lives and we don't even pop our head above the torrent that we're in to look around and see that there is a new thing. But I'm telling you, God said, for every person who will receive it, there is a new thing. Go find out what it is. Go search it out. You know, the word of God will lay like pages, closed pages, this book closed, unless we go open it and find out what the new thing is. Start to pester God. He always answers. He will always answer. My people are experiencing lack, and mo most of them do not know how to overcome it. They do not all know me as the God of the breakthrough. Did you know that God is the God of the breakthrough? You know it. He's the God of the breakthrough. He will always break through. Always. The only reason God doesn't break through is because we don't ask him to. Because we put up with where we're at. And we sit in the mire and we wonder why God isn't moving. And he isn't moving because we haven't put his promises on the run, so to speak, for our lives. They haven't come out of our mouth. We haven't employed them to run swiftly through the earth and change our circumstances. They do not know me as the God of the breakthrough. You tell them that the God of the breakthrough wants to visit them. But we must prepare ourselves for his presence and his visitation. How do we do that? We just seek his face. We get in his face. That's pastor's favorite phrase, I think. I'm going to go get in God's face. And get in his face, she does. Until she gets what she wants. And that's how we have to be. We had a little dog when we were teenagers. Her name was Michelle. And when she wanted something from you, she was a little brown French poodle. She came and stood on your feet. And she would not budge. She would not get off your feet. It's such a picture of us with God. Go stand on God's feet like little Michelle did. And get your face in his face and tell him what you want. I mean, all things pertain to life and godliness, right? Everything. Everything we need or want pertains to this life and this godliness. Why can't we go get it? He said, you tell him that the God of breakthrough wants to visit them, but you must prepare yourself for his presence. That means you take time and you get in his presence and you worship him and you worship him. You bring his word to bear. You pray his word. You seek his face until you have a visitation. And I guarantee you that visitation will transform your life. You will never be the same ever again. Because God always has new things. And if we've ever needed a new thing, we need it now. In this world, in this culture, we need it now. Maybe we didn't need it in the 30s and the 40s. Well, we need it in the 40s because of the war, but maybe we didn't need it at like we need it now. When we see the breakdown of of morals and the breakdown of systems of, of, uh, of order. Now we need it. So what is it for you? Only you know and only you can go get it. 
Psalm 115, 12. The Lord has been mindful of us. Do you know that? He's always mindful of us. Because I experienced it with a visitation from the Lord, God's eyes never leave us. Did you all know that? I have, his, his eyes are always on our face and our eyes. He's always looking us right in the eyes. And I know that's true because I had a visitation from him. And his face never left my face. His eyes never left looking into my eyes. It wasn't disconcerting at all. It was glorious. His eyes were always on me. And my eyes were fixed on him. His eyes never, never stop looking at us. But here's the thing that I noticed. Did you know that God doesn't blink? Not one time did he blink, which would mean that his eyes weren't on me for that split second. God doesn't blink. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to irrigate his eyeballs. His eyes are perfect. He doesn't get debris in his eyes, so he doesn't need to blink for that reason. And the word says his eyes are always on the sparrow. And if they're always on the sparrow, how much are they on his beloved humanity, whom he has created in his own image? They're always on us. And they're always trying to elicit, elicit fellowship, fellowship. I want to bless you. Tell me what you want. Tell me what you need. I want to pour out my blessings on you. I love you so much. What can I do to help you today? I want to help you. What problem can I fix? What can I solve for you today? Pour out your heart to me and I'll help you. He said, I will help you. I will help you. I will help you. Three times he said it. I believe that's God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each said, I'll help you. God said, I'll help you. The Holy Spirit said, I'll help you. And Jesus Christ said, I'll help you. All three. Isn't that wonderful? All three said that they would help us. And we just thought he was being redundant. He wasn't being redundant. The three in one had to speak for themselves. The Lord, Psalm 115, 12, the Lord will be mindful to us. He will bless us. He will increase us more and more. God will bless his covenant people. We are heirs of his blessing. And Jesus only blesses. He never curses us. He said he'd open up a new door. What's the new door? Job 8, 7. Though my beginning is small, my future days will be very great. But my future days will greatly increase, and I will flourish even in old age. This is the perfect will of God. And I don't know, well, I do know, it's, it's the environment we live in and the devil himself that says, no, you can't have that. You can't continue flourishing and have every heart's desire that you want in this culture. This culture is too negative, and God is too distant, and God doesn't really listen to all your prayers. You can't have that thing you want, that you desperately want, or that you desperately need. Nothing could be further from the truth. But I've experienced this in God. If you quit because you bought the devil's lies that it's not for you, and it will take too great an effort. If you quit, you will never have that thing you want. Will you? Will we? If we stop midstream. But if we stay with it, if we stay with it in belief, in faith, quoting the promises, praising and thanking him that we believe that we receive it and we have it, we can't lose. We can't lose. 
The trouble with the body of Christ is that we give up and we throw in the towel and we walk away and we say, well, that took too long. I, I guess God didn't really want me to have that thing. Nothing could be further from the truth. Do you know how I know? The Bible said that God will give us the desires and the secret petitions of our heart. Secret petitions? The thing nobody else knows about but you. That God will grant those. That he will give desires that only you know, not another living soul. They're so buried deep in your own heart things that you desire and you've never shared it with anybody else but God knows it he said that he would give us those things those desires that are secret away and covered even covered maybe with years of non-belief and inactivity on our part he said he would give you those desires now you just have to dust them off and start speaking them out of your mouth. God said he has new things for the body of Christ. And I believe that in his goodness and his love, he brings the new things to refresh us from the society and the world that we live in. I mean, isn't that goodness? Isn't that what a father would do? Refresh his people on a continual basis because the world is so negative? And on the, their way, the opposite way, shall we say? Of course a good father would do that. And God is nothing but a good, good daddy. Now, there are no end to God's surprises. Have you ever asked God to give you a surprise? I want to challenge us all. Let's ask God to give us a surprise. His surprises are never bad. And he never jumps out from behind a door and says, boo, to scare us. His surprises are always good, because he's always good. Can we ask God to give us a surprise, a delight? Does anybody have faith for it? Well, let's do it. Let's covenant this day, God, that you will give us a surprise that will delight our heart. And we won't. We won't forget about it. We'll just remind you every day that we have a surprise coming to us from you because of your goodness. And so our spirit and our hearts open to receive it. Let's, let's, let's see. Let's put this to the test and ask God. He said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it for you. Did you notice that preposition, for? Whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it for you. I think that's marvelous. He'll do it for us. Why wouldn't he? He's all powerful. He's the God of the breakthrough. He's the God of all goodness. He's the God of all love and kindness. He's the best daddy and father that we could ever know. So let's ask him to do this thing for us. In Jesus' name. There's land that God wants us to possess, and it's not just physical. It may be physical, but there's land, in quotes, that God wants every person who's listening to go after and get. And I'm prophesying this in Jesus' name. I want us, each one of us, to ask God, God, what's the land you want me to go get? What is that thing that's on the table? The table is your hands being extended to us. This is the table, beloved. What's on this table that you want us to go get? Because he said, the mighty man possesses the land, and the honorable man dwells in it. You understand this is mankind, so women, you're not exempt. The mighty person possesses the land, 
Possess means you have to go take it. You have to go possess it. The verb there in, uh, intimates that we have to put some action to it. We have to actively go get the possession. We have to go get it. And the honorable person dwells in it or dwells with that possession. In Jesus' name. I'm going to read another scripture. Isaiah 48, 3. The former things I declared of old. Do you realize that those former things God had spoken before they happened and declared them? The former things he put into motion by declaring them before they ever were. And so they happened. They went forth from my mouth, and I made them known. Well, God spoke them. Now, there's a clue. God spoke the former things that were not. They went out of his mouth. He made them known. Then suddenly I did them, and they came to pass. There's a clue here. The things that we want get scripture that cover it, speak it out of your mouth, make them known to God, and they shall come to pass. Give them time for those scriptures to grow up. You know, scriptures have to grow up. Sometimes scriptures start out as babies because they're babies in our heart, and when we speak them forth, they're just infants. They're just a hope and a prayer, so to speak. They're just a, oh, I hope this. Oh, I hope this scripture will happen for me. Sometimes promises start out like that because we have a draw toward that promise, but we're almost incredulous that that scripture could ever happen to us. So they're babies, or in that stage, they're, they're newborns. You see a promise. Oh, I wish that could be for me. And so you begin to pull on it. You begin to draw on it. You begin to speak it. And you let those scriptures grow up. Scriptures have to grow up too. They have to grow up in our heart. They have to grow up in our faith. They start out as babies, maybe newborns. Of course, newborns. We've just seen a scripture. We've never seen it before. We've never activated it by our faith. We see that scripture. We want it. We start possessing it. We start meditating on it. We start praying it to God. We start speaking it out of our mouth. We claim it by faith. Then as that grows in us, the scriptures grows too. Scriptures have to grow up. They start out as newborns. They start out in our heart, the very depth of our heart. But as we bring them out of our heart and begin to say them and proclaim them and believe them and go to God and get in God's face about them, they grow up. Then this is Isaiah 48, 3. Then suddenly I did them and they came to pass. There are seasons of suddenlies in God. And we love those seasons of suddenlies when it comes to the word. You have heard and now you all see this. Will you not declare it? From this time forth, I make you hear new things, hidden things which you have not known. They are created now, now not long ago. Before today, you have never heard of them. Have you ever had that happen? Before this day, you never had a scripture that leapt out at you from the word of God, which means that God's anointing is on it. When a scripture le leaps out at you, it means the anointing is on it. God wants you to have it. He wants you to go get it. Because it's life. It's life. It's liberty, it's freedom, it's, it's the Holy Spirit saying, go get this, go get it, it's yours. I'm putting it in your, your spirit, I'm putting it in your imagination, your sanctified imagination, I'm bringing it before your eyes. I'm putting it in your heart, now go get it. Go get those scriptures like that. They are created now, not long ago, before today you've never heard of them. Hearken to me. Hearken to me. 
Hearken to the me that's in that scripture that God wants you to go after and get. Hearken to me in the impossibility of the thing that you want. That's already been provided, because all things have been provided for life and godliness in Christ, right? Everything that has to do with life or godliness, two all-encompassing things, have been already bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. Amen. Numbers 20, verse 1 through 8. This is the rock of God's provision. I tell the rock before who you stand before their eyes to give forth its water, and you shall spring forth to the water out of the rock. Body of Christ, that means we have to speak things. There's a rock in front of us. It seems impenetrable. It seems, uh, Numbers 20, verse 1 through 8, it seems like a thing that you could never have, but you have a draw in your spirit toward it. It's in the word of God. It's sanctified. It's not, it's not something evil. It's the rock of God's provision. So you speak to the rock of God's provision. You tell the rock before whom you stand, before your eyes, to give forth this water, and you shall bring forth the water out of that rock. But did you notice, you have to speak to the rock. You can't just wish and hope. You have to say something. It has to come out of our mouths. And there's a rock of resistance. All of us have, body of Christ, all of us have a rock of resistance. A rock in front of our faces, in front of our, our hearts, in our lives. It's called the rock of resistance. The remedy is you start speaking to that rock. You tell it to get up and get out of your way that you will have that thing that, the, that God has declared you can have. You are to speak to the rock what you desire. You are to command the rock to give forth its water and its supply. It will produce for you not just of natural water, but the Holy Spirit water of power and provision. So, God has provision for everything anybody needs on earth. He's never without remedy for anything. But he's waiting for us to rise up in boldness and alacrity, know his word well enough to know to go after these things and not look at this huge rock and say, well, I can never get over that. I can never get around that. Oh, yes, you can. You start speaking to it. You go after what you want in God, both what you want in him provisionally for your life, but also the things that you want from him for in terms of giftings. Go after him for everything because it's already been given to us. Amen. Father, we thank you for your great goodness. You're so big. You're so huge. We've never understood how big you are and how big is your provision for us. And we just get small in our own minds. And we get stumped when we're in a no water situation. But Lord, there's always water because you always provide because you are the water of life. Now you said to the body of Christ, I'm gonna do a new thing. Behold, I'm gonna do a new thing in your lives. Do you not see it? Shall you not see it spring forth? The word says. But I say this to you as a codicil, it will never spring forth until you talk to it and command it to spring forth and make itself known and evident to you. You talk to it. You talk to the no provision, seemingly no provision. God always has provision. You start commanding that thing that you need and you want to come forth in the name of Jesus Christ. And it may take a season. There are harder rocks, bigger rocks than other rocks. 
Some rocks crumble easily. Others are like basalt, and they don't yield their fruit easily. So you talk more to it. You command more to it. You talk to God about it more. But the rock will yield its provision. It's in its DNA, so to speak, because God is the God of the impossible. Amen? Hallelujah.